Hi class, welcome to Accessibility Part 4. The last lecture is part of the series on accessibility. Um, we're mostly going to be covering robustness with a little bit of a wrap-up. So this one's going to be real quick. So robustness. Content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. So this is fairly straightforward. Um, it's really just about following the spec. Um, there aren't going to be too many curveballs here. Um, even though, say, Chrome or Safari or um, Firefox might be liberal with with trying to interpret your HTML or CSS or JS, um, we just want to be extra careful here because there are some user, um, user agents that have to interpret a lot more of the page, and it just helps. It just helps a lot here to have. Um, really uh, accurate content. So this one's super basic. The HTML must be pos uh, passable. Um, a lot of this comes for free as part of modern um, JS frameworks. So I won't spend too long on this one. Opening and closing tags and attributes must not be malformed. So here you can see there is no um, end tag. Um, it's just going to throw off the, um, the tag stack. Um, here, um, in the, in the second half, we have, we, we don't have a trailing slash. So, um, your JS framework should probably do that for you for free. Um, something to be careful of if you're handcrafting something or you're just using it a, a fairly old, um, a fairly old framework. Um, there are some checks that won't be called by modern JS frameworks, either just to, due to limitations or just that's not what the JS framework has, is trying to solve. Um, so, um, a doc type needs to be defined. Um, the reason why JS frameworks usually won't handle this is because JS frameworks are added after the fact, and this is something that, is need, that needs to be defined before the fact. Um, so here, a doc type needs to be defined, and it's really just saying um, this page is a HTML page. Um, it's a kind of a vestige of... Um, of early internet um, or early web pages. Um, there's, this is just something that we need to do. Um, we also want to make sure that we're not defining multiple IDs. So, uh, sorry, not multiple, uh, duplicate IDs. So here, um, this is e really easy to miss. And I think that's kind of um, something to be careful of here is to not define multiple duplicate IDs. So here you have, a, you, have, you have a component that has an ID of component ID, and you don't think too much about this, this looks right. Um, and then you add a function to, uh, you add a component to that, that has both of them next side by side. Um, what you didn't realize is that X step, or what you may not have realized is you're creating a component, you're creating a, 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 a HTML element with the same ID twice. So you need to add a prefix to guarantee uniqueness, or um, there are some generators there. It's probably a little bit beyond the scope of the course, um, but you, that's just something you want to be careful of. So you can check that with the actual rendered HTML page. Um, you might want to be careful of this with with uh, inputs that you create that um, you, you might want to try to genericize it, try to lift up the ID um, to the form component and then handle it there, and then try to prefix the form with um, with some specific uh, label, like a, like a sign-up form or something like that. Um, this one is also important, reference to IDs in ARIA labeled by in HTML4 exists. So this one is also fairly straightforward. It's just, I want to flag how you can miss it. So um, if your modern JS framework is, if you're trying to use it in a clever way to unmount the element when it's not visible, um, a common example would be, say, a tooltip that only shows up on hover. Um, and you want that, the label of the tooltip to point to the, to the element. There is actually a case where you should, um, you, um, you either should always have the, the tooltip mounted. Um, but if you don't want that, you probably want to use ARIA label instead and have the text directly on the element. Um, yeah, so the ID has to always, always exist. Um, you don't know in what scenarios um, the user is trying to query the label of the element. 
And this one's also fairly straightforward. Um, it would be really nice if JS frameworks have this, but they don't really support it that well. Um, relevant attributes are added, uh, added to tags. So don't add a, um, um, a value attribute on a div or, um, just, just, yeah, uh, try to be careful. Um, JS frameworks, you can create a lot of abstractions over the HTML element. Just make sure that the relevant attribute is added to the tag. So elements with roles. Interactive elements must either have a role or use a special tag that implies a role. As long as you're using buttons, inputs, and links, this, pro this is almost definitely not a problem. But if you're, devising, if you're defining your own custom interactive element, um, anything with an on mouse down or an on mouse up or an on click, you must add a role. And any role that you do add must be appropriate for the UX. So yeah, that's um, this one is also fairly straightforward. Um, if you if you are using a button, an input, or a link, um, just don't override the role. Say with button role equals none or role equals presentation, um, unless of course it is a presentational button. Um, uh, yeah, so generally stay away from divs, as I said in an earlier section, that's just going to give you a lot more accessibility um, with the way keyboard handling is at play. But in other parties, also defining the role is also really important there. And that's the end of the content. Um, that's the end of robustness. Robustness is fairly straightforward, especially after all we've gone through in the previous three sections. Um, but what I did want to spend a little bit more time on... Um, additional content, this isn't going to be assessed, um, but I think it's really important, especially as you enter the workforce. The first one would be to use accessibility tools. I think um, this makes a big difference to understand um, how to create good labels, how to avoid duplication. Uh, that, that's not something I wanted to address in this course, but that's something that um, is relevant where you want to make sure your label doesn't conflict with your placeholder. And it doesn't create, it doesn't say it's a button or anything. Um, so using accessibility tools will show you, will show that better. Um, so with Apple, um, the accessibility tools come pretty much out of the box, both for Mac OS and iOS. That's really nice. You don't need to pay anything extra. Um, oh, none of these you have to pay anything extra, but I think. Um, there are a few tools that I didn't include on this list that are also pretty popular. I just didn't want to include them because I didn't want to um, include things that require money. Um, so with Apple, it's called VoiceOver. And um, uh, there's a bit of a typo here. It should say VoiceOver instead of GuideOver. Um, but yeah, uh, on Mac and on iPhone, you can click the link and get the get the guide. Um, that's... Um, it's fair, it's, it's probably the most intuitive one. Um, I think, uh, the way that it, ha it passes things is done pretty well. Uh, if you have Chrome, um, and this can be for all computers, including Windows, Linux, and I guess Apple, uh, you can use the Chrome screen reader. It's not as good. Um, I believe it is, it is supported, it is managed by Google. Um, but I believe it's just not, um, something that's, super applied across the industry. It also doesn't really sh give you a comparison of um, desktop applications or mobile applications. And Chrome has talkback. I haven't, I got to add a disclaimer that I haven't used, I haven't used this one. I've used the other, the other ones and they're pretty solid. Um, from what I've seen, and uh, talkback is Android's one. And um, yeah, so um, these are the screen readers that I think are really useful. Um, of course, it's screen readers aren't the only tool. Um, there are some other tools around checking color contrast, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there are also Chrome plugins that turn on um, your screen to match a particular, to emulate what it would be like if you had um, color blindness in a particular variation. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think it's really important to use tool to use the tools that you're building for. Um, this is, this should just be treated in the same box as user testing. So additional topics, um, we have reduced motion. 
So um, I kind of mentioned it before in the in the section on seizures and epilepsy. Um, we don't want to have things moving too much. Um, so there's this CSS property called prefers reduced motion, or not CSS property, more like a, a CSS selector, but it's not for classes. It's quite similar to how you can query for the screen width. You can query if the user has set prefers reduced motion. Um, and what do you, uh, so just to be clear, um, this is reduced motion, not reduced animation. So you can still animate things and fade things. And fading is really nice for accessibility purposes, especially when you're changing the color quite drastically. Um, so this is specifically about motion and moving things around. Here we want to be, um, we want to try to respect the user agent's um, requests there. I'll mention dark mode because it's um, quite a modern trend. But uh, dark mode can also improve accessibility. Um, it can also degrade accessibility. I think when you're um, creating designs in dark mode that you're, you're still being wary of color contrast. And um, I would, I think people prefer adding an animation if you are changing between the two without a, without a refresh. Um, but yeah, really just be mindful of the color palette that you're creating. Um, the colors that are not black and white are gonna be the most hardest, like how to deal with red, how to deal with um, link text, all these things, I think you just gotta be careful about what you wanna do there. Um, but it can really improve accessibility. Um, people will often use dark mode in the dark and I think it really helps the eye strain and um, yeah, it just really makes a big difference there. Um, but yeah, m much like with a lot of accessibility, this is just gonna be generally useful, um, yeah. So audio descriptions um, are slightly different to subtitles, um, but they're in the same category and captions as well. Um, so captions will be like the label of an image. Um, it'll be in context. Um, subtitles will be the, the part of text below it. Um, subtitles, um, then generally not as useful um, if you're, if you're, um, if you're deaf, um, it's a little bit less useful, um, but it's still really useful. Um, it's, it makes a big difference, um, especially when the subtitle is a different um, piece of the, the video that you can follow along. So audio descriptions, um, they're specifically for videos and um, much like you can have, a, you can have different tracks, uh, audio, you can have different audio tracks one for English, one for um, Chinese, one for French, one for German. Um, there's often other tracks um, for audio descriptions and they'll often, yeah, be for each language. So it doesn't change the video, but what it does is it changes the audio and you'll try to keep the dialogue there as much as possible. But in between that, you'll describe what's happening. So you'll try to describe, um, what the characters are seeing, what's happening off, what's happening on screen. Um, yeah, so this is something that's, that's, that people are trying to make it, make a, um, make an impact here. Um, Disney is probably the, be the most standout one here. Um, you'll probably see this for a lot of Pixar movies or Disney movies or like a lot of the kids movies they have, they have, have this. Um, also a lot of the Marvel movies have this. Um, yeah, it's, it, it really adds engagement. Go ahead and click the example of engaging audio descriptions. Um, I think it really makes a, it makes quite a big difference. Um, uh, it's actually more engaging, um, than it might sound, especially with the tone of voice of the audio description. Uh, I can't play it here on this video due to copyright reasons, uh, but go ahead and click the link. It'll be on the slide. Um, or if you're watching it on Canva, you should be able to click the link. Cool, so that wraps up um, the basics of accessibility. Um, of course, there's always more to learn. Uh, we only just scratched the surface, but this is gonna give you a good framework for understanding how to think about accessibility and how to, um, yeah, how to, how to consider that um, as a developer.